Hey everyone, welcome to the On Deck Circle podcast powered by FantasySixPack.net. Uh, I'm your host Dave Eddy. You can find me on Twitter uh, at Corporal Eddy. Uh, this podcast goes along with my popular dynasty rankings on FantasySixPack.net, uh, which you can find updated every other Sunday. In between those week of ranking updates, uh, this podcast is going to be dropping to discuss them and answer some of the questions uh, that y'all have for me. So if you do have any questions about the rankings, go ahead and drop me a comment on that article. Uh, hit me up on Twitter, find me on Reddit, uh, wherever else you might run into them. Uh, I've got a, a big time guest this week. Um, very happy to introduce the, the very handsome um, and of course world renowned prospect Jesus himself, uh, Mr. Ralph Lifshitz. How we doing, Ralph? How's it going, man? Thanks for having me on the show, Corporal. Well, I tell you, you had to you had to beg me to get on, but I, I was able to make a little bit of time for you. Um, cleared cleared a couple things out of my out of my schedule so I could make it work. So um, you owe me a big one on this one, Ralph. Hey, no no problem. I'll uh, I'll I'll figure it out. You All right, Girl Scout cookies. I can I can hook you up with Girl Scout. Uh, Samoas are the way to my heart. So yeah, that would work. All right. Sounds like uh, sounds like we got a deal then. We're good. We're good. All right. I'll good. Pay good. Off my debt and Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> That's probably the best offer I've had in in weeks. Sorry. Sorry if that's the best offer you've had in weeks. <laughs> uh, I know, right? Well, <laughs> well, I hope you're getting better offers than Girl Scout cookies. Man. Uh, nothing. Not legally speaking, no. All right. Well, <laughs> we'll we'll keep that off the air then. So fair uh, enough. Fair enough. What's going on, man? How are you? Oh, I mean, things are busy as hell. Um, you know, obviously outside of, you know, doing these rankings, real life always takes a little bit of precedence. So um, this is, if anything, probably same for you, a little bit of, you know, getting away and just kind of doing something, you know, that is less stressful and, and whatnot until you get to all the questions that, that everyone asks. But um, so, yeah, it's just, you know, a fun little fun little hobby, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, no, it uh, it definitely is. You know, I've, I've you know want to push it, and certainly uh, you know myself, really speaking here, do more than that even. But um, yeah, you know, it's uh, it's a balance between you know real life and uh, what you sort of build, you know, in this world. Whether it's you know fancy side of things, or you know, I've expanded into you know some more like the in person scouting type stuff. But yeah, I mean. Uh, it's still a balance between that and you know actual real life. So essentially, it's a it's a very very self indulgent hobby. Yeah, for sure, right? Very uh, time consuming as well. Now, you know, normally, I mean, th- this is you know, in regards to dynasty rankings. So when it, when you're talking dynasty rankings, prospects are, are something that that have you know a much higher value than you know, obviously a lot of other formats. So. Um, with the last week's or last episode, uh, the podcast there, we went ahead and I was covering basically top 10 guys at each position, um, with a little bit of a rundown there, went top 10 overall. And this time I wanted to get a, like I said, a world renowned expert in here to talk specifically (laughs) about prospects. Um, I, I think that anyone who does dynasty probably, you know, has, you know, got got a, a soft spot for prospects, and if you don't, um, you probably eventually will if you're going to compete. So, I, I just wanted to dedicate this in, entirely, pretty much to to that. Um, so, with that in mind, I think we'll you know start off with you know about as basic as it gets, um, and we're just talking uh, you know our individual you know top ten prospects. Um, so, I think number one is is going to be fairly obvious. Uh, we're talking Wander Franco. Um, people have probably heard you talk a, a thousand times about him. Um, but what would you say you think his, you know, his, a prime stat line for him, you know, um, at the major league level, what, what do you think that's going to look like? <laughs> you know, it's still hard too, because with some of these guys, you know, you know, Broncos probably at least a year out, but you look at like, what's the, what are the major leagues going to look like in their prime? That's the toughest thing, right, to kind of quantify that because I think that what we would have put on primes for guys who are in their primes in 2019, 2020 with the juice ball, there's some power there that we maybe wouldn't have uh, thought we'd see. Now, with Franco, I think this is one of those guys where it is a pretty easy call. Um, His prime years are probably going to come relatively early, 
24, 25 when he still has like his peak athleticism because he can run a little bit. So I think you're you're talking about a guy that could potentially, you know, hit 300 plus. You know, you're talking about a batting title sort of, you know, hit tool in that sort of Vlad Guerrero mode. And you can go back with comps, you know, years after year after year until you get to Miguel Cabrera or whatever. OBP ability, you know, he's just so mature at the plate, especially when you consider this guy would have been like an incoming uh uh, prep pick, you know, in this year's draft, and he was, you know, essentially in in high A, just you know, dicking on everybody, ready to you know push up to to double A. Um, OBP skills, ton, you know, good power. It hasn't truly manifested itself yet, but once again, he's an 18 year old kid. This is a guy that was hitting for fairly good power, especially when you put the age and everything else, you know, level into historical perspective. His power numbers were actually good. On page, they look a little bit more pedestrian. He can run as well. I think the big question with him is, does he stick at shortstop? I think right now he can. It's just a matter of, you know, with obviously the depth in the infield, um, you know, in Tampa, maybe lack thereof over a third base, where does he necessarily slide in long term? But I think if you're talking just straight stat, stat line, I think we could be looking at like a 300, 400, 550 type of slash line, 30 homers, 18 to 20 steals, you know. And then big counting stats, because this is a guy that can hit, like, one through three in the order. I mean, I think really at any of those positions, you have different benefits, but you're going to get those those counting stats. And when you have when you have a guy who's a plus runner, gets on base that much, he's a good shot to score 100 runs, even if he's hitting in a third hole. And uh, you'll be able to back it up with maybe, you know, 100 RBIs as well. He could be one of those prime guys that could be, like, you know, 50 combined home runs, steals, 200 combined runs and RBIs with obviously a great batting average. Uh, and those guys are the big difference makers. You know, it's about all those counting stats, not just the power and speed. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm a little proud myself even to say that, you know, the the projected, you know, prime stat line that I have is spot on exactly with, with where you're at. You know, um, you know, I'm looking, you know, probably an average, you know, 315, 310, you know, in the prime. 30 home runs, you know, 100 RBIs, you know, 100 plus runs, 15 ish stolen bases, um, you know, 400 ish on base percentage, uh, 600 slugging percentage. I mean, those are just off the wall kind of numbers. Um, but I mean, that's the kind of upside that he has. And I think, you know, like I said, he's 18, you know, he's young. So um, it's kind of hard to feel confident, you know, so to speak. But I mean, it doesn't it doesn't get any better than you know w- what you're looking at when it comes to him. I, I like how you had mentioned Vlad, you know, earlier, and I think it's kind of an easy, you know, kind of comparison to to make. But if you were drafting Dynasty, um, if you you know, wh- where would you be putting uh, Franker or Wander's value as far as you know what round twelve team league? Where 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 do you think is you know being high on him where do you think is being low on him you know i think it i think it depends on what the format is what the scoring is we're talking like a standard five by five roto dynasty yeah. league 12 teams Oof, you're starting from scratch mm-hmm. you're not you're you're not going to get him in a third round probably not you're probably going to have to get him like middle of the second to like back end of the second and i bet you there's even some people who would take him top 12 sure just based on, you know, I did three startup dynasties this, this offseason. That tends to be <clears throat> what I'll do a lot in the offseason is I'm kind of digging through MILB games, writing it up, doing our top 30 lists. I'm also trying to do like a bunch of different drafts. And I'm somebody that tries to play a bunch of different formats. I'm primar- primarily Roto, and like, that's where I lean. But I also understand that there is a huge market for points leagues. And I should at least know what the hell I'm talking about. Um <laughs> So, like, I think maybe, you know, in a points league, it's a little different. He might get pushed back a little bit um, because he's not a pitcher, you know, uh, and, like, immediate value pitching is so valuable in that format, even from, like, a trade perspective, especially when it's shallow. Because I'm in – my home league is a 12-team head-to-head points league. And, uh, uh, like, Franco probably wouldn't go in the first 60 picks, you know. But if you're talking about, like, a lot of these dynasty leagues have been doing where it's, like, five by five or OBP or average, you can swap those out. Bronco's going in the top 30 picks easy. And I think that's probably where his value lies. Um, 
he's going to be a great player in all for- formats. I just think it's a matter of the collective mindset of the room, right? There's a little bit of hive mind to each style of fantasy. And I think, uh, you know, that kind of dictates where you draft and how you draft and the context of everything, you know? Yeah, for sure. And I, uh, I, I, we did a startup. Um, I did an on deck circle, um, dynasty it's a roto league startup and we're yeah. uh, we're we're in round oh boy let me see we're we're in round 93 i'm actually on the clock so uh sorry for all the guys that are waiting around for me to pick uh why i'm why i'm talking on this podcast but oh, we gotta pick on air but, but they can they can they can kiss off um i was looking to see if i could find him real quick see where he went in our league but it wasn't that easy so um but as far as like, I know we're spending a lot of time on, on one person here, but I just like to get someone else's perspective on, on something. Because I mean, your first, you know, your first few picks specifically, you know, that the top three, you know, are, are really huge, and you really, I feel like you really have to be precise on those picks. Um, you were talking about, you know, he's he's not a hit, or you know, he's not a pitcher, he's a hitter, and I am definitely in the camp of strongly valuing. Um, bats over arms, um, especially the, oh, yeah. the the younger that you get. But as far as a, a dynasty perspective, um, I'm going to name off the, the couple of pitchers that I have ranked ahead of him. And you tell me if you were doing just a straight up, you know, was, you're on the clock, you have the choice between this guy or, or Franco, who are you taking? Okay. Okay. All right. So Garrett Cole. Uh, Roto. Um, yes. I'm actually uh... – Oof, that's close. Um, I actually think I'd rather have Franco. Would you? Okay. It's okay. Well, then we'll, we'll do the next two. I think there's a, for me personally, there, there's a top three starting pitching. So, um, yeah. so Jacob DeGrom. Yeah, I'd still, I'd, I'd rather have Franco. Wa- Points league, it's easy for the pitchers, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Walker Bueller. See, Bueller's the one that came to mind because he's a little bit younger. Yeah, I and, hear you. I hear you. Um, you get a few more years, like, you know, there's a little more tread in those tires. Um, where like either of those guys are shut down for a year, they get a shoulder issue, and you're talking about like finito, you know, like you may never have that guy again. Mm-hmm. And that's the problem with pitchers, right? I mean, because I'm the same way. I I hold off on pitching, even in like redraft leagues, because I don't feel like there's a great return on investment um when you draft pitchers really early because it's going to be guys that have knocks already that fall a little bit and maybe you can kind of get them on the you know the 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 upswing um but you know i i think that that's the difference between roto and points is that's why i like roto i'm good at roto i'm really good at roto you know you look at our tg fbi ranks you're going to toot my own horn here eddie's one and i'm i'm five overall between the two years of course i've never won a league but somehow i'm five overall i'm really good at coming in second. <laughs> <laughs> I am the best second place team in TGFBI history. I think something um, something shady and and smarter <laughs> side of things, if I, if you ask me. You know what it is is, um, I've had guys that were like top five overall that won the league each year, and then yeah. they just didn't repeat. I scored almost the same exact amount of points too, um, but like in points leagues, and it's tough to make that adjustment because I have been a really good roto player, and then. I got linked up with uh, a couple of guys here locally in Massachusetts that I used to work with. And it's like a, it's like the league, like they just talk shit all day long. It's, it's hilarious. And it, and it goes like above and beyond. Like there's a trophy. We, we get together and we draft. So it's a different experience, but it's a head to head points league. And it was a huge adjustment for me. Um, as funny as that sounds like values are like crazy different. So I'm just going to say that because that's a dynasty league too, but it's just a very, very different animal. And I feel like there's more and more of those, but we are talking Roto. I'm going with a hitter and, and, and a guy like Franco is so unique. It's like, you know, we could have had this conversation about Acuna a few years ago. Obviously there's some more speed there, but I, I think the impact could be very similar. I mean, you're talking about a guy that could be a top five to 10 pick right off the bat. Um, and I think, you know, with someone like Franco, like it, it, it's hard for me to pass that up for even like two excellent years of ace level production, even if it's three, because I know I could get a decade out of a guy like Franco in the middle of my lineup, and I might be able to pair him up with a first round bat already.
already. And I think like that combo can be deadly. You know, that's that's what you build your your foundation or your dynasty team on, you know, because um, those guys play every day and you're going to get four to five category production for a real a real long time. Yeah, you're almost making me feel bad. I mean, I've got him at I've got to rank 36 overall, obviously a top prospect. Um, sure. But that, that's why I was kind of asking you originally, you know, roughly where would you think he would fall in a draft? And even though this isn't necessarily a draft board, I mean, it kind of is, right? You know, I mean, I, I look yeah. at it and I say the guy right ahead of him is George Springer. In all reality, if I'm in a draft and I, you know, in a vacuum say, all right, am I taking George Springer? Or am I taking Franco? I, I'm, I'm taking I'm taking Franco. Um, so, I don't know. It's, it's, it's what makes these lists awesome and a pain yeah. in the ass all at the same time. Because you could, I mean, you could argue just about every spot. You could argue a whole ton of guys, um, specifically once you get you know out of the top like hundred. You could argue fifty spots in either direction and and have a reasonable argument, you know. But anyway, yeah, it comes down to risk tolerance too. Mm-hmm. But at fifteen minutes of talking yeah. about Wander Franco, I think we can I think we can move on. <laughs> How's that sound? Um, so Let's my number it. my number two guy, I've got Joe Adele. Um, <clears throat> I've actually. Um, I've got him projected with a little bit more power um, than I do for Wander. I've got him at, you know, a prime of about 40 home runs, hopefully. Uh, but obviously, average is way down. 275 there on base. Percentage is, is down. Sluggings, everything else is down. Um, still on the bases, I've got them fairly even. Um, where where do you got Adele in, in your rankings? I have Adele uh, for this season. I have a rank three, actually. Um I got Louis Robert at two, and a lot of that comes down to the immediate value factor for me there. But um, I think it's kind of a pick em. Um I tend to lean for the guy that is probably the last time I'm going to rank him. <laughs> sure. So I'll rank right, him right. a little bit higher, cause just kind of knowing, like, you know, um, you know, Robert. Well, the other part of it, too, is, um, you know, Robert has his knocks, uh, but – He's going to play every day. He's got the contract. He's an elite fielder. And with the hit tool questions he has, I have similar questions with Adele. Like, he wasn't great in the AFL. And we kind of got our first bad reports, um, you know, sort of of his entire career, really. Um, I know he struggled in, in AAA at the end of the season. But, I, you know, I, I didn't take I didn't take much away from um, that sample. It, you know, it wasn't uh, – 27 games so i mean it was 132 at bats it was something but it wasn't enough that uh it scared me off of him there's huge power here you know you're talking 70 raw it's just about double plus um you know the hit tool is good enough but uh it's probably you know at best maybe like an average hit tool like he's probably like a 50 hit um he's gonna strike out a bit i think the the k rate you know is gonna pull down the average a little bit um uh, you know, in terms of his batted ball profile, it's kind of all over the place, but I would assume he kind of settles in um, closer to like 40% uh, in terms of fly ball contact. And that's going to drive down the average a little bit too. So um, he's a guy I can see, you know, hitting like 250 to like 270, depending upon, um, you know, his batting average on balls in play. And he'll be boosted a little bit because he can run. Um, I don't think he's going to have huge steal numbers. Um, he's not a great base stealer, but at this point he's still a plus runner and he makes a lot of hard contact and typically, um, you know, hard contact plus, uh, speed is a good combination for sort of, uh, inflated, uh, babies, right. Or, you know, batting average on balls in play. So it might drive up the average a little bit early on, but I, you know, I think he's probably like prime numbers, like 275 uh maybe like 345 um and then i think the the slug will be huge like he could be a guy that slugs 600 and you know hits 30 35 bombs um but it might come with like a a 25 to 29 percent strikeout rate um you know he kind of reminds me of in some ways and i think this is bad now but i think early on uh (laughs) anybody that's been following long enough will probably buy into it there's a little bit of like Justin Upton in him, you know, like he seems like that's kind of like the trajectory that we're looking at. And Upton was really good. I mean, he was a 2020 guy early on in his career. Um, batting average is a little bit higher, uh, but 
but he was and he walked a little bit more. I think he was a little more patient, didn't strike out as much, but game was a little bit different than two, ten years ago. So um I give him the benefit of the doubt. But I think he could be a similar kind of a player. Like he's he's gonna be an all star, uh, you know, but not not every year. And uh I don't think he's necessarily gonna be like a superstar type guy, just somebody that, you know, the talent's there. He looks phenomenal for stretches, and there's other times um, where, you know, he's kind of maddening. Like, I think that's the, the kind of player we settle in with Joe Adele. I, I like the Jay Up um, kind of comparison there, too. I mean, when you when you say that to me, that that, that makes a lot of sense. I can I can definitely see that. Yeah, it's not perfect, but it's, no. you know. So you had said, you know, he'll run a little bit, but, you know, not, you know, like, you know, won't be heavy in, in steals, but, I mean – nowadays that's that's a different story than it was even you know five years ago so nowadays if somebody steals you know 20 bags i would say that's that's pretty damn good so where exactly are you are you putting his his steals at you know prime Ooh, see because i wonder if like his prime year has come when he's not running as much um i yeah, think it's gonna sure. be like i think it's gonna be like nine to twelve i don't mm. think he's gonna be like a like a 2020 guy 30 30 really? guy um, yeah, I don't see 30-30. 20-20, I could easily see that. But, I, yeah, 30-30, I think, is out of the question. Maybe he'll surprise me. It just it, it depends on team construct so much and like where he's hitting in a lineup and how much he's getting on base and how often he gets those opportunities um, sort of dictates that. And it's hard because nowadays less and less guys do run, right. uh, like you said. But I think that's another sort of benefit in Rob, Louis Roberts' favor. He can run, I'm pretty – positive that he'll be a guy that steals 20 plus bases multiple times right where i'm not i'm not as confident on that with, with adele so so just just to ask the question just because it's something that that popped in my head and i i could see people you know without looking at you know my rankings or other rankings you know maybe questioning themselves but w- how would you compare the value then between him and his outfield teammate eloy um I would still take Eloy higher, uh, just right. because I think that the floor is a lot higher, um, and I think we're going to see another gear from him. Uh, he's never going to run, um, so I would say the ceiling is probably higher with Louis Robert. They're not that far off in terms of how I would rank them out um, for dynasty, at least, because, like I said, I think that like Robert's not going to have much much question in terms of um his everyday role and position a lot of it comes down to how he adjusts against the best in the world you know best pitching he's ever faced a lot of good breaking balls um good off speed stuff and just you know nasty fastballs he's a guy that has just insane bat speed that you know when i saw him last year for a series it almost seemed like he made the the decision to swing like as late as any human being I've ever seen in my life, which is remarkable in some senses, but also like kind of scary for his future projection, you know, like, uh, like, do we want a guy that adjusts that late? But that could be good on breaking balls as well. I just, I need to see it. He's one of those guys where this guy could be uh, uh, an absolute superstar, all-star every year, um, both sides of the ball, just phenomenal. It's just like, how much does that hit tool translate? Like, is it a plus hit tool or was he a guy that was just, you know, able to beat up on lower level pitching because of how insane his bat speed is and just some of his natural ability? Um, and the other part of it, I saw him in AAA, and I think when guys get to AAA, especially late in the season or real early before they get called up, because I saw Acuna in a similar situation, they almost look kind of bored, you know. Um, so I don't want to take too much away from it. But, yeah, I think the, the ceiling, like, why is Robert so huge that, if you took him above Eloy, I would think you were a little bit crazy. But mm-hmm. uh, you know, at the end of the day, a year from now, we might be like, "Nah, we should all be taking Robert Super High," because he's a guy that legitimately has thirty thirty skills. Um, and it's just a matter of what's the what's the batting average going to look like, what's the uh, uh, you know the on base percentage going to look like, because um, that's going to dictate like how high his slug is and really how many bases he steals, but. This guy hits like he did in the Myers. Um, whew. If he hits like 275, 280, um, his counting stats are going to be, you know, absurd, especially in that lineup with guys like Moncada and Eloy, you know. Uh, Abreu. 
<laughs> yeah, Abreu, of course, and even like Tim Anderson, who mm-hmm. like you know won a batting title last year. Um, there's going to be a lot of opportunity to drive in runs and score a lot of runs. They're going to be a really exciting team. Oh yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, t- terrible time to be a Tigers fan just in general, but when you've got you know what, what the White Sox are doing, like that—that's how you rebuild a team. You know, um, I mean, they, they've done a fantastic job. Um, I, I think that's exactly the model that. You know, I wish that other teams, you know, specifically my Tigers, could have pulled off. Um, just in, in, in wrapping up on on him real quick, um, I, I've got a gap between the two of them. So I've got Eloy all the way up at twenty nine in my rankings, uh, and I've got Robert down at sixty five. So, I mean, I'm a, I, I think I'm a I'm a little maybe not low man in the room, of course, but I, I think I'm I'm more towards that side of the fence at this point in time. Um, so it'll be curious to see exactly kind of how that plays out. And as the season goes on, how that gap either closes or, you know, increases or, or whatnot. Yeah. I think it's reasonable. Yeah. So, uh, who's, who's two on your list? And you said you had Wander one, you said, then you had, um, Robert at three. So who, who, we, who, uh, no, Ro- Ro- uh, I had Louis Robert two. And okay. I had, Del, I had a Dell three. Gotcha. And then, uh, I got Gavin Lux four. Okay. So I've got I've got Lux at three. So our top four are all very similar there. Um, what are, what are your thoughts, real quick, then on uh, on Gavin? Yeah, he's just a real talented ball player, and um, he's one of these guys that kind of took to the Dodgers um, internal development uh, skills like a fish to water. And you've seen him add power. Um, he's improved as a fielder. Um, you know, just a really talented. You know. Midwestern cold weather kid from Wisconsin, and um, he's just sort of blossomed when he's had the opportunity, uh, you know, to focus on baseball full time as a professional career and have arguably the best organization behind him to do so. Um, you know, do I do I think he's going to be a superstar? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I think he'll have his years. Um, the question with him is just how how much power does he does he have next year? Um, you know, is he going to be aided by, you know, the juice rabbit balls again? The rabbit ball is going to go away. Um, but I think he's a guy that's always going to hit for a high average. He's going to get on base. He's going to steal some bases. Um, it's just a matter of like, is he an 18 homer guy or is he a 25 plus homer guy? Um, and some of it may come down to him because he's got good bat speed and it could just be a matter of making adjustments and, um, you know, knowing the pitches that he can drive. But I, I think he's going to be a guy that's own universally in 12 team leagues and that says a lot of all prospects um and it's going to be right off the bat it's just a matter of is he an everyday player for the dodgers in 2020 um there's a little risk there but i think at the end of the day he's one of their best nine guys yeah no i, I definitely agree with you there um so i'm i'm hoping that your number five guy is my um the next guy on my list he's he's a guy that i i talk about all the time on twitter um the absolute number one favorite just as far as you know personal preference is concerned just you know favorite actual just individual prospect um who is it that you got next on the list uh is is your guy a mariner he is a mariner he plays in the outfield which which narrows it down to two and is he also from wisconsin just like uh gavin lux um i don't think so no (laughs) <laughs> Uh-oh. if he so, is he's very tan for for being from wisconsin all right so uh i have uh jared uh Kalenic five and i have julio rodriguez six okay it's kind of a pickup for some people yep. um i had him five matt had him five eddie had him eight eddie had uh julio rodriguez six and uh matt and i both had uh rodriguez six so we all had rodriguez six um eddie had andrew vaughn all the way up at five he's got his obp slant but um I like Rodriguez a lot. I, I think he's a really talented player. Um, you know, I think ultimately he's going to be, um, he's going to be a guy that runs a lot. I think there's been some, some talk of him trying to improve his speed. And, you know, this guy's a 15 to 20 steel guy. I don't know if that's the case. I, I don't I kinda, see that. No, I kind of look at Julio Rodriguez more as being like Nelson Cruz. He's, yep. he's going to uh, yep. come a lot earlier, like middle of the order, cleanup hitter, He'll have a good batting average, but he's going to hit on like 30 to 40 home runs like every single year. That's what I see out of Julio Rodriguez. Um, Kalenic, I think, just runs a little bit more, and uh, 
has similar power and sort of upside. Um, maybe batting average might even be a little bit higher. We'll see. They're both like super talented players. Um, I can just see the speed component pushing uh, Kalenic up a little bit for me. So that's my five, and then Julio Rodriguez is my six. Yeah, no, I mean that makes sense. I mean they're they're pretty much tied together. It'll be really really fun to see those two come together in that outfield. And I mean, I can't imagine that they're not competitive. Um, you know, so if it was me in that situation, I I would be balls to the wall trying to you know prove that hey I was the better prospect. You know, and and I, I you know had I've had the better career. So I mean I I would imagine there's got to be something going on between those two in the, in that regard because. It just it just makes sense. It, maybe I just talk way too much shit. I don't know. A little uh, friendly rivalry. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I, I mean, I got J Rod coming in at four. Um, Kalenic for me comes in um, down at eight. But I mean, like I said, I mean, I, I've got their you know projected prime stat lines fairly close. I've got like I said more home runs for J Rod. Uh, obviously, you know, double the steals uh, for Kalenic, and then on base percentage is close. I've got. J. Rod, you know, projecting at a higher slugging percentage because of that that power, but yeah, I mean they're they're both they're both high end prospects, obviously. Um, so then in between those guys, for me, um, I've got I've got two pitchers. Um, I've got Gore. I've got Lazardo. I've got those two again. I mean, fairly close as far as um, you know prime prime projections are concerned. I mean, not even enough to even talk about. I've got you know Gore striking out a few more guys. Um, having a little bit lower ERA, um, but I mean, at the end of the day, I've got those two very similar, um, and so those two come in at six and seven for me. Uh, where do you where do you put those guys? Uh, so I got Gore at um, eight. He's my first pitcher, and I have Lizardo, uh at ten. Um, you know, I, the injury risk. I think. A, Big big part of it is um, Lizardo is in the rotation. Like we, we know he's going to be in the rotation. There's a little bit more injury risk for me with Lizardo, um, just based upon his history. He's a little bit of a smaller guy. But Mackenzie Gore is just like an absolute freak athlete. Um, I almost wonder if I should have ranked Gore higher. Um, he's my favorite pitching prospect that I've ever covered. Ever, um, huh? Yeah, and I, and I actually think, like, I had this argument with James Anderson on Twitter. I think he's arguably the best pitching prospect in the last 10 years. When you put into perspective age, track record, and really what he did this year alone, this is really his definitive professional season. Because he didn't pitch much uh, coming out of the draft. And then um, 2018 was kind of this weird year where he pitched really well when he pitched, and he had some blister issues, and there was like an elbow flare-up. But, you know, at the end of the day, he had a decent season. Last year, he was dominant. And we talk about a guy that has a unique combination of stuff, velocity, control, command, and deception, and just like freak extension, athleticism, like everything you look for in a pitcher, Mackenzie Gore has. There's not much that he struggles with. And... Some people have brought up like Steven Strasburg, and like it's an excellent, it's an excellent point, excellent argument. Where Mackenzie Gore is right now on the cusp of the major leagues, where there is, if there weren't stupid rules regarding you know service time and everything else, and the Padres could still throw caution to the wind and go panic, to tease like they did last year with Gore. Yep. It, this guy could, should be in the majors. He should be in a rotation. There are teams in the major leagues where this guy would be their ace day one. Like they're they're opening day pitcher. There's literally multiple teams in the major leagues so that would be the case. At this point in age, Steven Strasburg was going into his final year at San Diego State. As good as he was, he wasn't even the professional rank. This guy already has that track record. The other guy people bring up is Matt Moore, and I think there's an argument there. I don't think Moore's command now hindsight's twenty twenty, right? But I never yeah. felt like Moore's command was as good as Gore's command is. Um, he's just so unique. I like, I could watch Mackenzie Gore starts every day of my life. Like he's just, even his bad ones, just really fun to watch. There's guys like that. Brent Honeywell was like that. Mackenzie Gore's like that. Don't, don't and, talk about Honeywell. Like he's dead on me, Ralph. 
Well, I'm saying like when I watch him in the minor leagues, I'm hoping right. that we don't see many more minor league starts uh, with Honeywell. But you know, I I saw him in AAA a couple times. So um, and he was a blast. He got slammed for like seven runs once, and like Rusny Castillo hit a homer off him. He was still like a blast to see. <laughs> he was Brett Honeywell, but um, yeah, for me, Gore is just like another level. I think he's better than Whitley. Like there's just a touch of, because there's pitchability there. Like I think that's the thing that people miss. Everyone looks at like big stuff, look at strikeout numbers. Some of that comes with the territory. There's guys who strike out more batters two, three years, four years into their major league careers than they ever did in the minors. And a lot of it is they learn how to fool hitters. They get better information, you know. Um, they're better at preparing. They're better at, you know, game planning things out. Maybe they get a better catcher. There's so many different things that go into pitching. It's such um, a meticulous skill that even if you're – throwing the ball great there's so much crap that can go wrong and a stat line doesn't necessarily tell it and gore is just so professional at this age and he just uh dominates in so many different areas of the game for me that yeah i mean i have two in my regular list it's franco and then gore when it comes to fantasy i'm just a little bit more risk adverse um especially with young arms but yeah, he's a lefty that throws 95 96 you know like there aren't many of those guys either he's just He's just such a, a unique guy, and then the, just the mechanics, the leg kick. It's just, I don't know. It's like what? It's like you know, it's it's artistic. Even it's like the best way I can put it. Gore's Gore's mechanics are just wild, and it's so weird that he's athletic enough to make it all work. You know. So am, am I kind of picking up then that like command is is your big thing when you're looking at at pitching and projecting pitchers? Is that what you're big on? Um, yeah, I think command, but you got to be able to, you got to be, it's a few things. Um, you certainly have to throw strikes. You don't want to walk guys, but you got to be able to miss bats. That's a thin line. It's tough to be able to do those things. And you got to be able to control contact. Um, that's really what those pillars, like throwing strikes, you know, being able to miss bats and being able to limit good or hard contact. That's what makes pitchers you know great that's what makes guys major leaguers versus quad a guys you know roll 30 roll 40 types um that's you know that's the difference between the ones and the twos um and the fours and the fives and you know etc but yeah it's it's absolutely what i look for but i think you need to have a balance you can't, you can't just be all control you know um there's plenty of those guys that throw 88 and can just pound the zone all day long and manipulate stuff. But um, you have to be so far and away um, able to just command. Like you have to be like Kyle Hendricks to make that work nowadays in the majors. you got to be able to throw 93. You know, if I see a guy that's like throwing 88, 87, 88, um, I saw a guy like that this year. He's a draft prospect, Logan Allen mm -hmm. uh, from FIU. Nasty curveball, you know, good break and stuff. Um, you know, he spots his fastball, but it was literally 87 to 89. I was kind of like, how jacked up can I get about 87 to 89 when he's, you know, six feet tall? And I don't think he's all that projectable. He's already a college arm. Um, you know, I could be wrong. He could be a guy that, you know, comes up and he adds a few ticks and um, whatever. But then we start to get into the question of, like, does it come naturally? How much more susceptible to injury are you? Uh, when you really start to like max out your delivery. Um, and that's one of the things with, with Gore is he just kind of naturally has that stuff and it all sort of works. Um, and that's what, that's what makes guys like him or even Lazardo to a lesser extent um, so special. Cause there's so many arms, there's so many arms, you know, and so many really talented guys. I mean, there's, there's guys with, with 80 fastballs that will never make the major leagues. As crazy as that sounds, it's true. There's guys with amazing fastballs that just everything else that sucks. You know, and they'll you know maybe see a few innings. It's yeah, just, I mean funny. that that's kind of the the Tigers' draft history lately. Is you know they just grab guys that can throw a hundred and, and see what happens. And uh, I mean not like you know at the top of the draft super recently, but I mean that's the kind of profile that that they go for is just give me a guy that can throw hard and let's see what happens. Because um, like you said, you have to throw hard nowadays. You know, uh, you, you really aren't going to get by throwing. Like you said, high 80s, um, you know, unless you're Jamie Moyer, kind of uh, a mold, for, you know, 20 years ago. It's just, it's yeah, just it's, not the way baseball Hendrick. is anymore. Yeah. It's Hendricks. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, mm -hmm. I mean, 
we could take a look at it right now. I mean, how many guys, how many guys that start that are good throw under, under 90 miles an hour, even, you know? Um, yeah, it's just, it's just not the way the game is anymore. No, there's, there's like almost none, which is, which is kind of remarkable when you think about what it was like even five, six years ago, you know, um, the games change, man. It's just, it's a, it's, it, 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 you know, you gotta have the stuff you got to And I, and I see so much amateur baseball over the summer with the Cape Cod league here and something I follow closely. And, um, yeah, I mean, I don't even pay attention to guys when they throw like 86, 87. <laughs> Right, yeah, I got you. You know, I'm like, you, you have to add like 10 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> like, you got to get about 10 feet closer, throw from the bottom of the mound, not from the rubber. Oh, well, the way they're recording <laughs> velos now, anyway, that wouldn't matter. <laughs> you know, they're not they're not clocking at the plate. It's the uh, release point, I think. So even that, you know, changes up a little bit. Yeah, look, look at it right now. Guys that threw under 90 miles an hour, okay, or 90 miles an hour or under. Um, Hendricks is 86. Mike Leak was 88. Um, and Leak is a guy that's like all finesse. Mm-hmm. Um, Marco Gonzalez, another guy with a great command. Julio Tehran, um, whatever you want to make of that. Adam Wainwright, Granky, who's just a surgeon. Uh, Lucchese, John Lester, Clayton Kershaw, Fires, Porcillo, Annabelle Sanchez, Wade Miley, Ryu and anderson like and you have to essentially have like like a couple of good secondaries um or you have to be a control artist which is what most of those guys are yeah um but they're also guys that you know like rick porcillo or mike fires could have a three era one a three and a half era one year or five and a half era one year so yeah it's just not a recipe for success right uh so rounding out the top 10 here um the last two guys i have are outfielders one I've got such a huge crush on probably my second just favorite prospect in general, uh, Christian Robinson. And then my, my 10th guy, I've got uh, Dylan Carlson. I think I, I, I don't know, am I crazy in your opinion? Well, I mean, not crazy, but how high am I to have Christian Robinson at nine? Um, you're pretty high on him, but I can see like the tools are tantalizing. And he's a guy for me, I have him 16. He certainly could be within the top 10 within like three months. Like mm-hmm. it's not out of the realm of possibility power um the hit tool there's still some concerns some questions there i wonder how the body ages uh, but i could be wrong there too um that could just be a maintenance thing um but yeah i mean I he's not all that far off um really talented kid and uh yeah i mean in the big scheme of things it's what uh you know eight spots uh, so right you know big deal it's eight prospects out of uh you know how many thousand players and affiliated baseball so um you know sometimes i think we lose sight of that uh but yeah i think it's just you know it's your preference and i i uh i you know i think in the right situation i could see doing it um you know robinson's a super talented kid i think he came in 12th overall on ours so um, okay. eddie had him eddie had him 12 overall so it's not all that uh, crazy i mean it's it's pretty close to some ranks that are already out there uh, i had carlson seven and the other guys I had just to round out my 10, I had yep. four, as I mentioned, at eight. I had Marco Luciano uh, at nine. I just love the power there. I love the swing. You know, he's a little bit younger than Robinson. doesn't have the, the uh, speed component. But I think he's one of these guys that could be like a Nolan Arenado. I'm not saying that he is Nolan Arenado. But like that sort of like prototypical power everyday third baseman with a good batting average that can hit 30-plus bombs. I think that's a guy that can do it. I love the swing, and I think he's relatively um, safe for a guy that's as young as he is and, un- and unproven. But, uh, yeah, so maybe I'm a little crazy on Luciano. I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, uh, you know, having him that high is, is – I mean, I have, I have him at 11, so it's not like I'm, I'm far behind, you know. Um, I think he's right there. I, you know, I you, was the you low could... man. I was the low man. Eddie and Matt both had him seven, so well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, I could. I. I mean, you could put him in the. You could put him five, and you know, you could argue these things all day long, um, and, and not be wrong necessarily. You know. Um. Yeah. So 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 let's move on to guys in um eleven through fifty, um, that you know we want to talk about, and one guy that, 
I get I get some I get some comments in both directions on saying oh you're you're too low on him or oh you're too high on him which is kind of confusing because you know w- you know which is it is it, am I too low on a guy am I too high on a guy or does that just mean I'm spot on you know um, and and for me that's Adley Rushman I, I've got him coming in at 19 um, so so what are your thoughts on on him and what are your thoughts on on that that spot. Um, it's probably more consensus than I am. Um, I was the low man on Rushman and I'm not that low on Rushman. I have him 27. Um, uh, Matt has him 16. Eddie had him 18 and Eddie is usually low on catchers, but Adley is so unique. He's a, a switch hitting catcher with plus power that can probably hit like 280. Um, the catching component always gives me pause. Yep. Um, so I, you know, I put him back behind some guys that are a little bit closer. Um, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of people would argue with a like Christian Pache, who I have 18. Um, I'm a Pache fan. I believe in him. I think he's going to continue to improve as a player. I think the power will come. I even think the speed will play up a little bit more than it has. Um, there's other guys like Brandon Rogers, who's probably the last time I'm going to rank Brandon Rogers. Right. Um, yep. And I think that through being kind of negative about him for a couple of years and like telling the industry to pump their brakes, everybody pumped their brakes too much. And now it's like, this guy's ready to launch. And we've all like kind of like poo pooed him enough that it's kind of what happened with Trevor story the guy all of a sudden could come up and like, he could hit there's, there's 60 hit 60 power. It's just a matter of him refining his approach to the plate. And that's something that can come with time and experience. He's gotten some of that. He's had a whole entire offseason and a lot of the season injured to think about it and work on some of that stuff. So, um, you know, I got some guys like that in between them. Uh, but, you know, they're all big names, more or less, between him and Rushman. And for me, still, Rushman's a guy that could be in my top 10 come July. You know, we get some graduations, some guys go down a little bit. Rushman shows up and really, really hits and produces. Um, you know, he'd be really valuable. I just always pump the brakes a little bit with any catcher. Uh, Cause I feel like it's a position that, um, you know, you can kind of plug and play, play without one sometimes even, and it's not going to completely sink you, especially in shallower leagues. Um, you could usually find somebody that's hot. So um, I don't know. I, I just don't invest a ton in catchers. So I think that's why uh, my rank on him is a little bit lower, but I think your rank is probably, I mean, even the big senior things, once again, it's eight spots. So right. it's not that big. And, and I think ultimately he's an easy top, you know, 20 to 30 player with, without, you know, much question. And I think if you had him outside of that, it's probably too low. Because he's yeah. just that talented. Yeah, I think the the catching position in particular is, is always a difficult one because there's such a drastic difference between real life and fantasy value. As just a prospect in general, I, I would put Rushman in the top, at least the top 10. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't have a real life, you know, rankings list, but if I did, he, he he's probably in the top five. You just don't get that same, you know, value out of a catcher, obviously, in fantasy. So, you know, there's a big difference between saying, yeah, I could I could argue that he's a top five prospect in real life, but then, man, he's he's, you know, right around top 20 for fantasy, and it really does come down to, the position he plays and how most people uh you know feel about that position and i i feel like probably you do uh, you know i'm either all in on catcher and i'm gonna pay up and i'm gonna get you know a sanchez or a muto um you know rushman or i'm just gonna dick the dog you know and i'm gonna i'm gonna sit around and i'm gonna take someone you know i'm gonna be the last guy that takes a catcher or you know um and i just don't believe in in paying up for that position uh so you know I guess it depends on on your particular, you know, your your personal preference on catcher, uh, to where you'll either look at that and go, oh, geez, Rushman at nineteen, you're you're crazy, that's way too high, or oh, you're crazy, that's way too low because you're on one extreme or the other. Um, so to be a homer, let let's talk about uh, Casey Mize real quick. Um, I have I have very mixed feelings about Casey Mize, uh, mostly good. Um, but just a lot of concern, you know, over his, his, his injuries, his injury history. Um, I have no concern over his his upside. 
But talk to me a little bit about, about your thoughts and feelings on Mr. Mize. Yeah, I mean, you know, pitch ability wise, uh, he's off the charts. And, um, you know, he's got multiple pitches that he can attack. Um, you know, he can just sit all off speed if he wants to, um, especially with that splitter and that slider. Um, they're both plus the double plus pitches. Um, you know, he'll mix in a cutter as well. Uh, it's a bit of a variant on uh, the slider, but those two pitches are great. Um, his fastball is above average to plus. Um, the, the velocity is pretty good. Uh, he can lack command at times, uh, and it can flatten out a little bit, but I do think it works up uh, well uh, in the zone. Um, really, that's only been his, his issue has been sort of fastball command when he has been at his best, but uh, overall, it is still really good, and he dominates uh, with that splitter. I mean, that that pitch is, you know, one of the best secondaries that I saw uh, last year at any level. And um, I got, I had the fortune, the fortune of being able to catch him a couple times. I caught him in Lakeland early on in the season, uh, and I, then I caught him uh, later on in the year with Erie before the injury. So um, I got to sort of see the best of my eyes. And he dominated down in the Florida State League. It was mostly fastball. He didn't have to worry about his secondaries. Uh, he's kind of toying with guys. And then, you know, in in, uh, in Erie, you know, he was against Hart. And they made him work a little bit early on. Uh, didn't have his best command with a fastball. But he settled in uh, second time through the order. And by, like, the fifth inning, there was a point where I don't – I think he was a, he was pitching backwards. I think he threw, like, you know, it was probably 10% fastball that inning. It was just – it was crazy. And he dominated. Like, he just – the slider was almost like his fastball and just throwing a splitter and nobody could touch either of them um, because, you know, they, they sweep through the zone. There's so much movement. There's a ton of break and uh, his command of those pitches is really phenomenal. Uh, so I think that's what sets him apart. But we know about the, the injury risk uh, with a guy that throws the splitter as much as he does. So, um, you know, I, I think you have to bake that in a little bit. Uh, that's why I have him ranked 34 and I have uh, Matt Manning 15 for fantasy. And I really like Matt Manning. Um, simply because Manning is so durable. Uh, you get, you get all the other upside. He's a different animal in terms of how he gets there. Cause it's really fastball curveball dominant. And he throws the change up a little bit, but he eats innings. And that's a concern with Mize. you need a horse. That's going to go a hundred, you know, 70, plus innings every single year, ideally 200. And I just don't know if I see that for Casey Mize. Um, he's a starter through and through, but uh, I think there's going to be some, <laughs> there's going to be some missed time. Yeah. And you, and you definitely read my mind again, but that was going to be my next question was how do you compare the, the two of them? Not just because they're teammates, but just because their values are, you know, have kind of aligned to, to be very similar. Um, so, so good on you for knowing exactly what I was going to ask. <laughs> um, so, so the next guy that I have on here, um, is, is Carter Keyboom. So I, I kind of feel like he's actually a guy that is at this point undervalued just simply because he, you know, he came up, um, struggled. And I think that, you know, we kind of forget about ex- exactly, you know, the, the upside that he does have. So Keyboom for me comes in at 34, which still is, is you know, possibly a little on the low side um, because I actually consider him to be kind of like a, a buy low guy at the moment. What, what, do you, what do you think about, about those thoughts? So I have Carter Keyboom 11. Okay. I, I think, I think Keyboom um, is going to come in and he's going to hit major league pitching we kind of forgot how young he was. He came up, he hit that homer. Everyone got crazy. Everyone bid way too much money on him in a redraft league without any certainty that he was going to have everyday playing time um, or that he was even ready for it. And I think that for some reason that that sort of took some of the, the you know, the shine off of him and it shouldn't have. It's a guy that like fantasy wise, like that's a really, really high floor. And there's ceiling there and he's young and it's, you know, a guy that's going to be in the infield. He's going to hit for power. He's going to hit for average. He's going to get on base. I, you know, I, is he a superstar? No, but I, I, I could see this guy being a, a pretty consistent all-star. Um, and I think the organization believes in him as well. I think he's going to get a fair amount of at bats this year. Um, should exceed rookie uh, status. 
So, yeah, I mean, uh, I like Kibum a lot. I'm going to own him in a lot of leagues because I feel like he is just consistently underrated at this point. Um, yeah, it's funny. We came in in 20 overall on our composite rank, but um, I've been high on Kibum. I've had him as high as like three or four last year, so I'm even down him a little, little bit, I guess. But, yeah, I don't I don't. I don't know what the issue is with um, keeping with a lot of folks. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, maybe they just don't see the upside. And I think, you know, maybe they feel he was exposed at the major league level. But I don't think anyone really thought he was going to be in the majors last year, to be honest with you, especially that early, you know. Would you be shocked if he was their opening day third baseman? Not at all. Yeah, no, I I, me neither. Me neither. Yeah, I, I, could, I could see that in the realm of possibilities. Uh, so so let's move on then. Um, let, let's start looking at you know fifty one to a hundred. Um, I've got I've got one name that I that I really want to talk about, and I guess I'll I'll ask a related but unrelated question, um, and then I'll get to the guy that I want to talk about um, for this reason. And the guy that I want to talk about is who I think is going to be uh, the breakout pitcher uh, as far as you know prospect is concerned for twenty twenty. Uh, that's the guy that I, I'm going to want to talk about. So, with that in mind, if you had to name a breakout pitching prospect for 2020, where 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 does that take your mind to? Uh, my guy is the Marlins Edward Cabrera, who kind of broke out already last year. Um, this guy, I think, can be, you know, dominant. He's already on the 40 man roster, so there's a chance that he could potentially see some time in Miami this year if they decide to go that route or he earns it uh, late in the season. But, um, you know, it's it's a hundred, you know, he can hit a hundred. He sits high nineties with the fastball. Uh, command took a huge step forward this year. Um, you know, works a slider and a changeup, both of which, you know, flash above average to plus. Um, he misses bats uh, for the most part, you know, he controls the zone, doesn't walk a ton of batters, uh, you know, controls, you um, contact gets a lot of ground balls he's a near 50 percent ground ball guy uh so for me i think he's a guy that um could burst onto the radar and um people could just be completely sort of shocked that eric cabrera uh, might actually be a top five pitching prospect in baseball yeah so the guy that i'm gonna go with um is, is shane boz and for, first of all i mean when i'm looking at you know prospects one thing that that I value a lot is what, what, what organization are they with? And I think it's hard to argue that, you know, the Rays develop prospects well. And I have a feeling that I don't know your, your thoughts on him. Um, I haven't heard to speak on him yet, but I have a feeling that you're probably not remotely as high on him just because, you know, control for him is an issue. Um, but he's the kind of guy that, that especially in dynasty, um, I really like because he's very high risk, high reward. And so I, I play for upside, you know, give, give me a booba, give me a, give me a buzz, you know, over, you know, you know, guys that are, that have a higher, you know, that have a higher floor. So, uh, that's, that's my, I don't know if it's a bold prediction or not. I mean, he's a top 100 prospect, but that's the guy that I think is going to be just, the breakout pitching prospect that just flies up boards of, of everyone this year. Um, what, do, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's just a matter of him having um, the control that's needed, um, you know, for him to sort of hit that point. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, Boz is obviously, um, you know, incredibly talented. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of hard to argue with that. Okay, well, that makes me feel a little bit better. Well, where would you? I mean, I don't know if you have rankings in front of you right now, but where do you have him ranked currently? See, I was going to look at that, and I, I actually don't think I had him on my top 100. Um, but, you know, uh, I had him one, 112. 112? I had him 112. I was the low guy. Eddie had him 68, and uh, Matt had him 73. So he was 81 <laughs> on our list. See, I thought he did make our list, but I had him 112. Um yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think he's a great pitching prospect. I just think there's uh, a lot of hitters, you know, and some guys are a little bit closer pitching wise. But yeah, no, I, I I don't dislike him. My question there is just really um, the bullpen concern, uh, and a lot of that comes down to his ability to uh, throw enough strikes to to be a starting pitcher. 
Yeah, I've got, I've got him sliding in at 71. It seems like myself and Eddie have been pretty damn close on, on most of these. So I don't know if it's just the, the whole Eddie aspect of it. Um, yeah. You know, Eddie and Eddie or whatever, you know. Maybe. But um, yeah, it's, it's a little creepy. I wonder if he's stealing off my list. I know I'm not stealing off his. But I'm wondering yeah. if he ain't peeking at mine, man. I'm gonna I don't change, know, man. I'm gonna, change I'm my Google him. Drive password. Do it. He's sneaky. He's sneaky <laughs> right. Um, so what about um, a couple guys that are outside of the top 100 right now that this time next year, so obviously, you know, guys that aren't going to graduate, but uh, guys that at this time next year you think, you know, are, are the most likely to, to be able to get up into like the top 50. Um, sure. So there's a guy, uh, that I'm thinking of here. He's a pitcher. He's on sort of real life top 100 list, but I think he's a guy that could potentially move up. I have a 115. That's Jordan, uh, Balazovic. I don't know if he was on your top 100 or not, uh, but I think he's a guy that could potentially move up sort of into that territory. Um, talking sort of, uh, another guy, another arm, uh, Tanaj, uh, Thomas is, is a big name right now. Um, I think if he sort of comes out and does what everyone thinks he can do this season, and he sort of repeats it and continues to move forward, there's a good chance that he's a universal top 100 guy. And I'll give you a couple of bats from the most recent draft, um, one being Peyton Burdick, uh, mm -hmm. who was Wright State kid, um, really talented in terms of you know skills during college. He looked great down the Cape. Um, he hit in college, the second-round pick. Went a little bit underrated, and this guy made some of the hardest contact in the Cape Cod League. I think he actually had the three hardest hit balls in the Cape Cod League in uh, 2018. You get all this information because I'm, you know, friendly with the uh, the trackman guys that are down there, so they they feed me some of this stuff. Um, so I do have it on some authority. And if you look, his bat speed is phenomenal. Go and look up Peyton Burdick on Twitter. There's a recent video that was posted last week, I think, from him showing up um, down in spring training. And I mean, his bat is just like insanely fast. And it's just a ton of bat speed there. There's more athleticism than anyone else realizes there were. He came in a pro ball and he just mashed, pushed his way all the way up to the Florida State League. Could be a fast mover. I, you know, he's outside my, my 125, um, but he's not that far outside. He's the guy, my fifth first year player to draft ranks. I wish I ranked about 10 spots higher at this point. Um, and I think people are starting to catch up to him. I think you can still get him for a discount in your leagues. The other guy is Hudson Head, another guy with insane bat speed, beautiful swing. Um, San Diego Padres, I think he was a third rounder, but he signed for, I think, the 10th or 11th biggest bonus in the draft. So he got early first round money uh, in the third round, uh, talented prep kid. And we know how the Padres are, man. When they make one of these wacky moves that makes you scratch your head, <laughs> We usually look back in a few years and go, damn, they really knew what they were doing there. Those are the ones they hit on. If there's other stuff where they don't hit, they're a little bit goofy. But those are a few names for you. Um, you know, one of them is definitely Hudson Head, uh, Peyton Burdick, Gabriel Rodriguez, probably another guy that's probably on the tip of a lot of people's tongues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would consider him somebody that could potentially move up. And then I think everybody give a little Yankee boost to the podcast. Um, Louis Medina, if he finds everything, he's a guy that it's going to click, and um, he's just going to be – he could be a you know great. The stuff is there. It's just a matter of does he throw enough strikes, does it all click, and he's a guy that can move up top on our list as well. So I, I picked um, th three different guys, and I, I kind of took one that was just outside the top 100, a guy right around 150 for me, and then a guy pretty much right at the, the back end of the top 200. Um, and one of them's a Yankee. Uh, I've got Antonio Cabello. Um, I've got him actually at 107 right now. Um, is is it say? I mean, he's he's officially an outfielder. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, he's a center fielder. Okay. Because um, I can more. Yeah, so I did. Moves, he's actually a plus runner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, coming at 156 for me, um, I have Seth Corey. And then the guy that I'm kind of most interested to, to hear your thoughts personally on um, is Diego Cartea. Um, talk to me a little bit a little bit about Corey, but I'm also really interested to hear what you think about Cartea and um, you know the chance of, of him just flying up some boards. 
You know, I'd have to dig in a little bit more on Corey. Uh, I know the numbers are really good. He's a guy that would be, you know, within the 200 to 250 range, like somewhere it could be 150, uh, like 210 or something. Um, I know the skills are there. I would have to watch him with pitchers. I try to dig in, like I watch multiple starts in every guy and kind of log stuff in a little journal so I can go back, kind of know what my notes are. It helps me kind of remember all of it too. Um, I haven't dug in on a Corey start, so – I don't want to speak out of turn and, you know, say one thing or the other, um, but I know that the numbers certainly back up that there is some performance there. Of course. Um, Cartaya is a guy that I know, you know, my former colleague before he uh, was hired away from prospects live, but the Minnesota twins, mm-hmm. Jason Panini saw quite a bit of uh, Diego Cartaya and, and ah, uh, yeah, I mean, insane raw power, bat speed. Um, he's one of those guys that I almost kind of wish he moves off of catcher. And there's like a, a real, like he's somebody that could actually, if, if he could actually play third base every day, it would be great. Like get this guy off catcher, get him away from having the dead legs because the bat is truly special. And I think that uh, that's what it is with Cartier. He's one of the more exciting catching prospects in baseball. Um, kind of like, uh, you know, Dalton Varsho. It's like, I just want oh, these guys geez. to not be catchers. Don't I- be a catcher. Have catcher eligibility for a few years and then let it go away. I mean, I think yeah, the Dodgers cool. would love that with, you know, Will Smith behind the plate and they got Ruiz sitting there and then they got Cartaya as well. I mean, you know, mm. uh, last I checked, you can you can kind of put one catcher on the field. So yep. I, I think yep. they would love Dodgers for, Dodgers. for him. Yeah. Um, so just a couple more guys that I just want to discuss that, that didn't make it anywhere else. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm curious to hear what kind of a comp you have on him because to me there, there's an obvious comp for this guy, um, and, and I anyone that I've asked this they, they kind of hit on it as well. But um, Nolan Gorman, if, if you had to, and I'm not in the business of comping people, but I just feel like it's so obvious. Um, where would you comp his his profile to? Oof. Um, huh. Off the top of my head, I'm trying to think. You put me in the spot here. Um, like to a current major leaguer? Yeah, well, well, I'll just tell you what, what I – I mean, yeah, like I said, I'm not in the business of comping, and I, I very rarely do it. But it, it just makes it just makes sense to me. And, and like I said, the few other people that I've asked this, um, we, we've kind of came to the same conclusion. And I can see I can see a, a, a Joey Gallo comp to, to Nolan Gorman. Uh, I don't know. What, what, I see. I don't. I don't. I feel like Gallo is a better athlete, mm-hmm. but I think that Gorman's ultimate hit tool upside is higher than Gallo's. I don't think he's going to have the same contact issues to the extreme that Gallo has him. Um, I have a little bit more hope for a decent batting average, and Gallo Gallo can run a little bit. Like I don't know if, if Gorman's going to run. Um, I, I don't kind think of so. Specimen. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. If, well, don't know what if would like you? What guy. would you? What would you prime his his batting average at? I mean, I, I've got a. I've got a. I, I mean, I would. Donaldson, I'd be happy with two fifty. Yeah, but Donaldson's kind of like a two sixty, two seventy hitter, right? Like he had great years, maybe a three hundred average, but mm-hmm. I think it's more like that power in the middle of the lineup. I mean, that's really what you're looking at. Um, but yeah, I think I think Gorman can have a. Um, a batting average that's tolerable, you know. Uh, I don't think he's going to be a guy that hits, uh, you know, two ten for any long period of time. Like Gallo sure, could be, sure, sure. You know, with like insane OBP that it really doesn't even matter because he walks like eighteen percent of the time. <laughs> I don't know if he's going to be that kind of guy. I think I think he can be a little bit more of a balanced hitter. You know. Well, um, I hope I hope so. Yeah. I, I would I would prefer that. I would prefer that. It's just I don't know. I, not not that the Joey Gallo comp obviously is a bad thing. I mean that's you know that, that if he had a oh, yeah, if he awful. if he turned into Joey Gallo, I would be thrilled to own him. But um, that's kind of where I, I don't know. That, that's just kind of where where I've always kind of looked at him. Um, what what about um, John Diaz? Uh, I mean, could he be two seventy five uh, and go twenty twenty? Like the. Like the Rays, mm-hmm. like J two prospects. Yeah. Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> too 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 far out for you to. Yeah, I mean, like some of these J two guys, because if you're getting reports from one source, it's pretty much Ben Badler, okay. Um, 
And it is really, really hard to know. And this isn't any like a knock on Ben or anything like that, but like, when did you see him? Mm -hmm. Who'd you get your information from? Um, He's pretty small. The bat looks insanely fast. He's supposedly pretty good athlete and a guy that could potentially stick in center field, but they think he might move to a corner. Um, That's really all you know about him. Uh, There's, you know, there's guys that were in camp that, you know, JP and other folks uh, on our teams saw in the backfields out in Arizona. Um, I have a better feel for them, like a guy like Reggie Preciado um, or even Mm -hmm. like Maximo Acosta than I necessarily do for some of the East Coast guys, just because like, I don't have any, I don't have any other reports. I don't have anything to say, Hey, this is what this guy looked like three months later when he came stateside. (laughs) So could he be? Yeah. I mean, some of these guys, I mean, shit, you know, I don't think anyone thought Juan Soto was the best player in that class. (laughs) That was a a loaded class. Yeah, sure. Everyone thought he was a pretty good hitter. If you read a scouting report, it sounds really good. But then you look at the rankings and it's like, Oh, he was number two, you know, um, it's hard. It's hard. And, And, but I do tend to trust Venezuelans, and Dominicans more than I trust Cubans um, just simply because there's such a high miss rate, especially considering a lot of them are a little bit older. Mm-hmm, and, yeah. uh, it's just different. You know, it's different, but they're, you're so young. Some of these guys are the kids like, you know, they're yeah, I mean, legitimately he's 17 seven, and a half years old. <laughs> yeah. They're seven years away from the majors. It's a guy, Ronnie Polanco, who was like, like 16 for a week. <laughs> like, I'm not even kidding. He was barely old enough to sign in this class by like three days. Mm-hmm. And these are guys that'd be like sophomores in high school, you know, in, in some states in the country or depending school districts, depending upon what the age cutoff is. Guys are sophomores in high school and we're ranking them for fantasy. So it's kind of funny. Yeah, you know? no, no, I, I get it. I get it for sure. I mean, I mean, when you start getting, you know, towards the bottom of these lists, um, at least for me, you, you start to scatter those guys in there because you're just yeah, looking, you're looking upside. for upside. You're looking for sure. lottery tickets and, sure. you know, he, I mean, that, that kid could never make it to double a, or he could, you know, be a perennial all-star. I mean, you know, it, you know, you got, you know, like you said, five to seven years before we even, you know, really get to find out exactly at yeah, the big league know. level. So you never know. Um, so last two, I want to talk about are, are kind of both, um, for someone in particular, um, First one is for um, is for Reese White, um, Chris Bubik. What what are your what are your thoughts on on him? On Chris Bubich, mm, uh, Bubich, Bubik, whatever. Yeah, it's <laughs> Bubich, Bubich, Bubich. Um, yeah, he's got a plus changeup. Um, mechanics remind me of Alex Wood. Um, I don't know, man. Let's see what happens to this guy. Like next year, gets more advanced competition. Um, he looks like he's a major league starter. Uh, to what grade? To what end? I don't know if we know yet. I don't know if we know yet. You know, I think I think he's a guy that you got to wait and see a little bit on. I don't mind taking a flyer on him. I own him in a twenty team league, so uh-huh. um, I certainly uh, I certainly have a couple of shares, as they like to say. But yeah, I mean, uh, you know, anybody who's like plus change up and an advanced college guy, I kind of expect them to dominate the lower levels because change ups really fool these guys below double a you know they don't have um much experience with good change-ups especially guys that sell it well with the you know their arm speed etc so how would you grade um him versus his teammate birdie singer i, I actually like reese is going to kill me for this i like singer more <laughs> still um you know i i I, I think he can be deceptive i think he can limit hard contact i think he'll miss more bats um as he gets a little bit older stuff is there. I mean, I, I like singer. Um, I think I might like Jackson Coar better than both of them. Uh-huh. <laughs> Lynch better than those guys. Yeah, but for sure. It's an, it's an interesting, um, force in there in terms of like how those guys are going to produce and what their roles are. I think Lynch is a little bit more, um, bullpen risk, but I think he has more upside to stuff is a little bit better. Uh, and I think Cower is a little bit of, uh, of, bullpen risk too um singer's probably the safest of the bunch but i think he'd be a mid-rotation guy i think it's just a, little, a tick higher um but you know the production certainly you know from from Bubich was tremendous last year so it's tough to totally uh knock that and we've right. seen change of guys that you know did make it work so 
Yeah, that's a that's an interesting an interesting uh, an interesting group, you know, to follow and, and sort of track um, what their progress is. Yeah, so that one was for Reese. Um, this one, if you don't, it, well, not you in particular, but if if you're listening to this and, and you don't know who this question is for, then um, you need to do a little bit of research, and I, I think you'll find out quite quickly, and and hopefully be as entertained as I am by it. Um, and and so the last guy I want to ask you about is Wander Javier. <laughs> Did you see that coming or what? You well, at least you don't think I'm Dusty Colorado. There you was might like a be. Point. That's what Dusty there Colorado would say. There was a point that literally everyone thought I was Dusty Colorado, and, <laughs> and like and like my friends and like people from Prospects Live were like pushing it, like they were like trying to like get people like really believe it. And I was like, Jesus Christ, like, I don't want to, because like he pisses off like. Keith Law, he pisses off like uh like the guys from BP. Like there was a point where like I think he was honestly like people thought he was like, harassing people. Like it was kind of hilarious. Um I, I think his account is as as funny as hell. I, I think he yeah, he, 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 he cracks me up. He's yeah. I, I, I don't know. If you get offended by by him or he makes you angry, that that's a you problem. He's just having fun, who whoever it is. Whoever it is, we tried to come to the bottom of it, but I don't think we ever did. But yeah, no, I mean, uh, who knows, dude? At this point, with like, with Javier, he's one of these guys that was like a huge, one of these huge J two guys. I think I jumped in like heavy too, uh-huh. and um, I don't know. I haven't seen him. Uh, uh, you know, it, it it never really materialized. You know, he he played a full year at, at A last year. He showed some power. Um, you know, he's kind of passive at times, but the approach was bad and really all he did was show power. So that's sort of a, a major question mark with, with, with Javier, man. I don't know. I hope he makes it happen. Cause I think, I think <laughs> Dusty Colorado is a lot better when Wander Javier is actually a player. Oh yeah. I could just yeah, imagine getting a, a decade of, of Dusty Colorado in, uh, on Twitter. It would just, it would warm my heart to no end, man. It would be awesome. So that that's all I got to cover. Um, anything that you know that we didn't quite hit on that that you want to make mention of? No, man. Uh, you know, you can find my work over at uh, prospectslive.com. We still get some more top thirties rolling out, and uh, we should have like a top nine hundred board um, once everybody is ranked and all of our top thirties are finished and cleaned up and updated, etc. Which should be pretty soon. And uh, you know, tons of in season content. Uh, we have our, you know, fantasy leagues that we launched. So we've been doing some tracking of uh, those best ball dynasty leagues, which is pretty cool. Um, so it's still a lot of fun. And uh, you can find me Prospect Jesus on Twitter. Yeah, I mean, anyone who's listening to this, I, I can't imagine that, that you have found me and are following me and you don't know who, you know, Ralph is. So it uh, does amazing work, uh, works with a bunch of great guys. Uh, absolutely one of the, you know, people that I respect the most in the industry. So I really appreciate you coming on, talking with me. Uh, so it's that, always a good time. It's it's educational as well. I uh, really appreciate it, my friend. Um, look forward to maybe having you back somewhere down the road. But yeah, for sure. But good yeah, time. man, I appreciate you rapping with me, and I look forward to continuing to, you know, reach out to each other and just you know have have you know some some fun conversations talking about, you know, talking about baseball prospects, man. Yeah, exactly. 100%. All right, Ralph. Thanks for stopping by, my friend. Thank you. All right, everyone, uh, that's going to wrap it up for for episode two here. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed uh, having a, a name that you know come on and, and talk about uh, the prospects that we like so much. So I appreciate everyone listening. Uh, I apologize this one went a little bit longer, but um, I, was, I, was, I had Ralph paid by the hour, so I was getting my money's worth. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll catch you guys all next time. Thanks.